joining us. Tonight we have Senator Honorable Harmony Wisa joining us to discuss the June 7th protest tomorrow in Liberia that has been named the Save the State protest. Honorable Wisa is a senator from River G or for River G County. So we'd like to say welcome to Honorable Wisa and thanks for joining us. Thank you. Okay, um, so Dennis, our host, will be joining us shortly. Um, he'll join sometime in the middle, um, but we will start this interview today just talking a little bit about the protests and why it was started. Uh, yesterday, we had Honorable um, Representative Slaw from Sino County discussing his views on the protest. He was not in support of the protest. Um, and so tonight we have Honorable Lisa joining us. Uh, the protest was called by a popular radio host, um, Henry Costa, and then was adopted by the Council of Patriots. Um, and so they are the ones really organizing and pushing the protest. Uh, the protest was called because uh, the Council of Patriots and others felt that more needed to be done to address the economy. Um, one of the issues stated in the call for this protest is the fact that uh, President Wea has not yet declared his assets. Um, that's one of the issues. Honorable Lisa, do you have um, anything to say about that? Well, I have um, often said that the way we frame the discussion sometimes make us to lose sight of what, what the problem really is. Okay. The issue is not the way I see it. The issue is not to hold protest or not to hold protest. It's not, that's not what it is. Because as for protestation, as for people expressing a view that may be contrary to something else, it is the normal thing of life. So, I mean, in the house, the children, our own children, can it come a time that they come to us and and express disagreement with what they see that is happening in the house. You know, that our, we say we show disagreement in some cases, in some cases to our, to our wives and our wives do the same thing to us. So, so the framing of the, of the debate or, or of this discussion, uh, as, and you're not the first person, you're not the only one, mm -hmm. is um, I think it's problematic. Okay. There is, it is a fact that there are some Liberians who intend to have a protest against policies of the government of Liberia, you know, under the leadership of President Weir. That is a fact. Mm -hmm. Whether one agrees with them, whether one agrees with the, the reasons they have is another issue altogether. What is on hand, I think that we are trying to discuss that is important to be discussed at all times, is that what is the situation in the country that is necessitating protestation by some group of Liberians, okay? And which protest the government is, is uh, resisting in one way or the other. Whether or not Protestation is a right to be exercised by citizens. You know, these are the these are the questions to be asked. So you summarize truly what we have heard. And I'm saying so because I am part of society and I'm at the position called the Senate. And we have been involved with uh, dealing with the issues of the protestation because we we see how people are being defining the, the the protest 
What have we heard? We have heard that they say they, and not just hearing, that we know and we feel that there is an economic situation in the country that is very harsh. The current economic situation is very harsh. It's eating into the soul of Liberian citizens. Even those who are in a high income earning bracket are feeling it because people come, increasing number of people now come to your house, can sit at your gate or on your porch, not just relatives, friends. Some people you least expected do come these days. And you know that the problem is very serious. You, you ourselves, the high income earners also go in the shops to buy things. So you find out that now the things you used to buy, the quantity of things you used to buy. Now, if you can feel it, if we can feel it, whether senators, representatives, ministers, uh, managing directors, and if people can feel it, how much more for the ordinary person who either has very little income or has no income, uh, reliable income at all. So that's the first issue, the current economic situation. The second concern expressed and that is being felt is the rule of law. There is a belief and people see that certain practices that is being carried out are in violation of law, the rule of law. There's uh, no respect for law. There is also issue of justice. People do not believe that they can get justice through the courts, through the, the criminal justice system generally, the one that takes you to the police and the police, uh, wherever. The entire process of justice, people feel strongly they're not having they cannot have justice. Mm -hmm. Then there is the issue of the fight against corruption. There is something called rampant corruption. That expression was introduced in 1980 by President, uh, by the coup makers of 1980, led by Master Sergeant Samuel K. Do. One of the reasons they gave for their coup was rampant corruption. And it has been given various names. So those are the four key areas that have become the subject of the uh, 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 of this uh, uh, protest. This is what has been expressed, and we think that it will be reflected in the document. Now, I am not an organizer, as you well know. Uh, but one whose work throughout my, my, my adult life has been fighting for justice, fighting for fair play, ensuring that we fight against, against uh, corruption, that we respect law, you know, that there is concern for the well being of all of our people. So, so when, when it's been said and I feel it, I have a uh, sympathy for what is being said. Now, how can we address that is the question we have, rather than whether people would demonstrate or not demonstrate, supporting demonstration, not supporting demonstration. That's not, uh, that's not the issue as I see it. So what do you see the issue as? It's not so you've listed for us the reasons for the protest, but you don't believe it's an issue whether or not they should or should not protest? Is that what you're saying? I'm saying that the framing of that question, mm -hmm. limiting it to whether or not people should protest or not protest, I say it's neither here or there. Because okay. if somebody wants to protest, they will protest. It, is, it doesn't depend on my agreement, my support for it or not support for it. My saying do not protest does not stop anyone from protesting. Or my saying go to protest does not make the people to go to protest. If the man is hungry, 
if they don't have food at home, if they do not have, and they see their children crying, they, 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 they see their wife is uh, grumpy because there is no food in the house to feed the children. You know, one of the things you try to do is to get out of it and try to find what is the problem. You're going looking for the food. If you can't find it and people passing and saying, we are fighting, we are making, we are fighting against others who, who are making it impossible for us to have the food for our children, you will join them. So it has nothing to do with whether or not I say you should not protest or you should protest. I think we, we give ourselves too much power, those who put themselves in this position of trying to say, uh, calling on people not to or, or saying that people, people uh, uh, um, should, that they are the ones who, who making the people do. The people will go. The, what is important is that you have it organized in such a way that we say that it will be peaceful. And so, uh, Senator, we said, do you believe it is organized in a way at this point in time that it will be peaceful? Well, we we have a, 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 we got some colleagues in the Senate with us who are who are members of the who are part of the COP, and they have assured us. And in all of the discussions that we have followed, whether discussions with the that involve the international community, that involve the government involve the police. Everything we hear is that the organizers say their intention is to have a peaceful protest, to have an opportunity, give an opportunity to our people to express what they, what they, uh, what they feel regarding these, these key areas. Issue of the economic situation, the rule of law, the question of justice, and the fight against corruption. So if I understand you correctly, you believe that the people of Liberia have their constitutional right to protest, and it, it doesn't matter, your opinion doesn't matter whether they should or should not. My, my opinion does not matter. Why, where my opinion matters as a senator is what are we doing mm -hmm. by the, 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 the constitutional responsibility we have to ensure that we are supporting policies that ensure that the, the economic situation changes, that we ensure that the rule of law is respected, that we, we show that there is justice in everything that we do, that there will be our court system will be functioning and that people who have a problem can go to a court and know and walk out of their feeling that they have seen justice. And of course, that we, are pursuing things that will ensure that corruption is fought and the evidence that we are fighting this corruption is made manifest to all of our people that our people will see it, that we are serious. That is my responsibility as a senator. And that is how I should be judged also, whether or not I am doing enough in this regard, whether or not those of us who are senators and as representatives or people who carry the mandate of the government, given mandate that is constitutional, the purpose for which we are paid salaries, we are giving taxpayers money to do that which uh, we, 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 we offer to do, for which we made ourselves available to, be, to, to do, for which our people elected us, or for which we take a commission from the president. Okay, so one of the reasons for protestation that you listed was rampant corruption. And so one of our viewers on Facebook, Dave Ja, asked, what is the evidence of rampant corruption and what steps has the legislative branch taken to ensure good governance? You said, what is the evidence? Yes, what is the evidence of rampant corruption? No, I am not making the charge. It's not the senator that is making the charge. The people in all of the Facebook, the, the social media, the radio programs, they speak about corruption. 
And one of the first things that it comes out, you know, to, to the people is when by your uh, standard of living, you are not able to demonstrate how you acquire what you have. That's the first thing that people see. And people begin to question. Now, they don't have to prove that they saw you stealing. But for example, if you start building a huge house, you know, and they know all of us have been this town, they don't know where you got your money from. Then they start to speculate that you must have gotten the money because the biggest money owner is the government. And if you are in a, a certain position in the government and you doing this thing, you're riding this car, private vehicles, and people know people you associated with themselves begin to manifest how much money they have and the way they behave change, their walking changes, the way they talk changes. Of course, they begin to believe that if we cannot give account, if we cannot explain how our leaders, you know, how our leaders got what they got, then it has to be through illicit means. Now, don't ask the people to explain. It is you who must explain. And that is why you must do things transparently, openly, clearly, that people can know that and can explain for you how you got what you got. You know, um, Daniel, when we were growing up, and one of the things that our parents, our parents were telling us, and which parents ought to start with their children, is when the child goes to school, when they come back and come back with a pen that you did not give to them, to that child, you must ask, as a parent, we have to ask, you know. If you keep coming, or she keep coming with pens all the time, and or he has a new pair of shoes, or she got a new pair of shoes, we must ask, where did you get this pair of shoes from? You know? Now, society then puts it on those of us who say we are their representative. They pay us. So when they see us doing something that they cannot account for, they cannot explain, that we cannot ourselves give reasonable explanation for, then they began to wonder what we are up to. In the meantime, while we are getting this new pair of shoes and new cars and new this, they cannot afford the shoes. They cannot afford the food. They, 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 they see you have more houses than you need. Then they begin to ask whether or not they begin to speculate. It starts from speculation because you cannot convince them how you got what you got. Okay. So it, it, it seems you're alluding to the failure to declare assets. And just to educate our audience, because this is an educational platform, uh, a leader, especially a president or anyone in an elected office is asked to declare their assets so that way the country can be aware of any sort of uh, property or gifts that were acquired illegally or by some ill means. Um, so with that said, last night we had Representative Slaw, as I mentioned, and he said um, those reasons for protestation that you mentioned um, is due to a lack of the legislature doing their job. So when it comes to the issue of um, failure to declare assets, what do you think could have or should have been done by the Senate? Well, let me say um, declaration of asset is the legal requirement, all right? That you must do and each, each person who has taken on responsibility on behalf of the government, I mean, for the government as a, in a certain position. The, the constitution says, or the law, the, first the constitution says that a law should be made. The law that has already been made require these things to happen. But even without formally making that declaration, 
because the declaration can be made. You know, immediately the public don't go behind you to say, when you say I have this, I have these and, and stuff to audit you. But they can see, they say your style of life, you know, that's what they see. That's the first thing they judge. They have to see. I just told you, how do we steal our children? You know, how do we begin to stop our children from getting involved in illicit activities? When you see them in the change of their, their lifestyle, you begin to question. If you don't do that, you will find out you will be, then don't be surprised. One day, if you, if, especially for girls, young girls, that you go low, the girl is pregnant. You know, she was wearing those things. You didn't ask. You see a gold chain, expensive gold chain. She was going out to this place wearing their shoes and you never asked. Or when you asked and she said, am I right to get this? Then don't be surprised when you see something happen, including a fight coming to your doorstep, you know? So in the particular case, yes, the law says that there must be declaration of assets that everyone should do. But what the law also says generally is against corruption. So that you, your standard of living, the way you live, the things that people see that you cannot account for, make the public to become suspicious. Then you then have the duty as a government official. Don't ask the public to explain how I say I got my thing. If you say I stole, you should tell me no. That no 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 no. The public don't do that. The public the public what the public know is that they see things. They see a lifestyle that you are exhibiting. They know your salary cannot do that. They know that if you, they and you generally were living in the, in the same community, you were living in, in New Town, for example, and you were renting one little room. Suddenly after you assume position, a certain position, everything about you has changed. Your shoes, the car you ride, the house you in, and they take your salary and calculate your salary. Never mind this, the new salaries that people talk about, but still people can know that even if you are making $10,000, it doesn't qualify you. It does not make it possible for you within three months to have a house that is, um, you know, to your, $100,000 or $200,000, not at all, you know? So that, that, is, that is the question I'm, we're talking now about corruption. And I, I'm telling you, I can go on to the other areas of concern mm -hmm. that we are very much concerned about. Take the issue of justice. Mm -hmm. We have to ensure at all times that justice is done to all. We've had a situation recently, and that situation still persists, where a justice of the Supreme Court was illegally, unconstitutionally removed from office. And what is not done legally has not been done at all. So what we have a situation today that we have six justices on the Supreme Court because we have not removed uh, uh, Justice Janet according to law. We have not. We did not. You know, and everyone knows that it was not done properly from the beginning, from the House of Representatives, from the charges that were brought against, and for the lack of rule, you know, no rule was used consistent with the constitution. The procedure for impeachment was not set up and therefore nothing was followed. Everything that was done was done haphazardly, unconstitutionally. We even went and convicted him and said that he, on, on one count of four that was 
put forward. But all, everything on which he was being convicted, the one on which he was convicted, was based on his work as a justice. He went and presided over a matter. And he said the matter too big for me alone. So I sent it to the full bench of the Supreme Court. The full bench sat down on that case. While they were doing it, the people who were involved in the matter said they wanted a settlement between the government and the, uh, the business people. So what was there that he did wrong? We voted, senators voted, and said the mayor is guilty. The constitution says that we must not punish a judge based on decisions they are taking. They are taking based on that part of their work. They must never be, just like for senators and representatives. When we go to Senate, we, they say what we say in Senate, in chambers, must not be used against us. So how do we apply it to a judge? So you, what you then have is that you are saying judges must sit there and wait for somebody from somewhere to tell them a decision to, a judgment to carry out on a given matter that is brought before that, that judge. The constitution want to protect the judges and therefore they say in article 73 that we must never punish a judge for that for what he did while he was presiding. So the entire process of Cabinet Jennings impeachment was wrong. So for some of the people who, were demo, who, who want to protest, they don't believe if they have a problem, they can go to the court and they get justice. So what, why do people protest? Why do people shout loud? They hope that when they shout loud, somebody will hear them. The person who has authority, when, when your wife shout, or when your children shout at you as a father, just think about it. Normally your children don't shout at you. Your wife shouldn't be shouting at you. But think about what you may have done that make them to shout. Similarly, when you shout at your wife or, or your, your children, it's something that you've been saying quietly that they didn't listen to. So there's the issue of, of why people going to protest. I don't know where the thing come from that protest means violence. No, protest does not mean violence. Protest means an expression different from the previous way by which you were expressing, the quiet manner in which you were expressing. You know, when you didn't get redressed, then you become louder. That's what protestation does. You become louder or you stand somewhere for people to see you. So you believe that this protest is a way to shout loud to the president and his team and that, that perhaps from this protest, all those issues of protestation that you listed could possibly be addressed? Yeah, all of us, all of us who are in government have a responsibility to listen. As senators, as representatives, the two of us are called legislators. You know, we must listen. You know, changes come about out of conflict. It's not, it's not all conflicts that become violent, no. In fact, society generally needs conflict to be able to see change. Do you know the whole history of, of change comes when there is some conflict. The car you see you ride moves because there is some fire, some heat on the tire must be, anytime it's slippery, it, the car will crash. Mm -hmm. So the car must press hard on the, the, the street for, the, for it to have traction, to move, to change its position. I don't want to tell you what can happen for us to have children. It doesn't happen just like that. <laughs> Serious operation takes place. And in the friction that takes place, some people can be happy, some, but something happens. And then the woman gets pregnant. When the woman gets pregnant, a whole lot of changes take place in that woman. 
And then she then gives birth. The pain of birth. It is after that pain that everybody begins to celebrate happiness. So, so nobody should be afraid of you know, disagreement and protestation. And that's why the constitution provides for it. Because they know they, there is no other way, you know, uh, so what we don't want is violent conflict. That people should sit down and talk. Sometimes the talking will be loud. People will shout at each other. But it doesn't mean that that means people are going to kill each other. No, we must stop the situation that lead to uh, people going to that level of killing each other. So leading up to the protests, we saw um, Honorable Yeke Kaluba leaving a radio station on Broad Street and violence occurring there. Then uh, the following day, we saw Honorable Kaluba arrested and droves of people at the, uh, at the police station. With all those events, you don't think it in any way predicts what will happen tomorrow? No, I think whatever happened was wrong. Mr. Koluba, uh, Honorable Koluba Yeke, went to the radio station. I saw the entire uh, radio program. I saw the, you know, nowadays, you don't have to be present. It's, it was it's on social media. So after whatever he did, whatever he had to say, he was going home. Now, whomever was involved in the stone throwing, that's what the police must investigate. You must not let it go. You must, the police must investigate who threw the stones. The police must not investigate whether people disagree with what Colbert said. No, that's not the purpose of the investigation. Because if you disagree, you should go to the radio station too and talk your own. That's what, that's what it is. The radio stations are open. You go there, if you need to pay money and you pay, you go to the radio station, you, you say what you want to say. You don't go and throw stones. So the police must investigate who threw the stones. If the police fail to investigate and arrest those who threw the stones, then the public is left with the impression that the government is aware of that stone throwing because it's the government that has the capacity to arrest people who, who break the law, who throw stones, who engage in violence. You can, you don't have the right to go and come beat up your, your, your own child or your, your husband, and you know that. When you do that, the police can come into your house and arrest you because you intend to hurt, to cause damage to, to people and, and break up public peace. So if the government didn't do that, if the police didn't do that, then police has some questions to answer. Then the issue of arresting or going to Kolba's house, you know, so here is the man that has been seen as, you know, he's not law, I mean, he, he trying to be disrespectful and stuff like that. But I saw how the police went, the people went to the, a court officials went to the house. He was cooperating with them now. And that entire uh, suspicion that led to the search was based on just May suspicion. Somebody say that he may have had arms or whatever else. All right. So all of the things that has to do with the right of a sitting legislator, why the house is in session, was ignored. The house is in session. We violated the constitution, but because the constitution is clear about the, the condition under which you can go and arrest a public official, I mean, uh, 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 a legislator. That condition, one of the key condition is that it be engaged in the breach of peace. But I don't know what peace uh, Kolba uh, violated. 
He went and spoke. He went to a radio station. That's no breach of peace. As I said, we got numerous radio stations and newspapers in a country. When you don't agree with what the other side says, go there and talk your own. If on the other hand, they say something that is about your character, you got the court, you go to the court and you say defamation of character. The police will investigate what was said and then they will charge the person. So based on everything you said, Senator, I think we can agree that what should always happen um, or what should happen doesn't always happen. So with that knowledge, there is the possibility that tomorrow things could go bad, people could go get hurt, things could be not peaceful. Um, do you believe that the government of Liberia, the police force, has the capacity to react to such a situation with a much larger crowd? I have not seen any situation where the police has more power than the people. So the police, knowing that also, is uh, take some, that's why they have all manner of ways by, by, the, by which the police collect information through intelligence, through this, and there's several ways that you can control a given situation. There are, there's never a time that when there is a mass protestation that the police and the masses of people who come out become equal. There's, you, can't want, you cannot have one-to-one. -one. That's why the police got the instrument of violence in their hand. It is they who can throw the, the tear gas. It is they who can shoot. It is they who have the baton. It is they who have the instrument of violence. And it is their violence that they exact on the demonstrators or protesters that lead the thing to blow out of order. It, 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 it doesn't operate the other way. Most uh, protestation and demonstrations, I mean, globally, I intended to be quiet. And people go quiet. It's only when the state intervenes with the instrument of violence that it has, that the state has in this in this hands, that the things begin to go out of hand. You know, people always talk about April 14. April 14. They speak about April 14 and they they get it all so wrong. I, I've had uh, some of my colleagues being helping to explain this situation. Uh, uh, Dusty Wolokoli has been on the air on local media, been explaining what happened. Sam Jackson, you should ask Deacon Carlo, you should ask, I mean, several other colleagues, you know, yeah, John Stewart and others who were named as the ring leaders, some who were not specifically named as ring leaders, but were seen and mentioned as you know, were pursued, and some who then got arrested. They will tell you what happened. On April 14, the announcement that was made, you know, um, it was about three weeks before the, three weeks before the, 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 the April 14 happened. That announcement talked about uh, protests against the increase in the price of rice. On the, the, the days leading to the date that was set, it was the government announcements, the threats by the government that anyone who goes in the street to demonstrate, we will deal with them. We will do this. The more the government did that, the more people wanted to know what would happen on that day. Many people heard about the demonstration the first time through the government. You remember, Maybe you were too young then, or yeah. were not even born. Oh, I wasn't. <laughs> so, in 1979, 
there were only two radio stations besides maybe uh, Yekepa, that was a radio Yekepa uh, and somewhere else. People, to, but the two national radios that covered the whole country were ELBC and ELWA. It was the government that were talking on those radios. There were no cell phones that time, 1979. There were no cell phones. There was no internet. There was no, you know, whatever you, you have you're talking about. We, don't, we didn't have that. So the announcements that there will be this demonstration was essentially made by the government. And the government thought that they would stop the demonstrators. That, that is what happened. So when I listened to some of the government statements around this uh, June 7th, I say, oh Lord, see how we're repeating. We're repeating exactly what happened in April 14. And who was the person that shot first? It was the government, it was the police. In fact, one of the first shot went to the police officer himself, who was who was uh, who was one of the commanders of the police. And when that fire went, and the second fire on around uh, Buse Quarter, where the first person was killed, everybody gets broke up, broke loose, and they began to attack. Uh, what they call it, or shops breaking into shops and stuff. Mm -hmm. So even people that the government organized, they did not realize that they would join in the, 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 the shop breaking exercise. So today when I hear people say, eh, they will do this, they forget that the police officer is coming from a home. When the police officer is leaving, he's leaving his wife without food. His salary is never enough. He knows he, he suffers the same thing. He sees his bosses in the police station and how they are living. Then they see that, oh, on this day, when there is demonstration, when there is protestation and they're sending us out, then they gave us money. So they too got an interest in confusion. Do you understand? Okay. And you say you go and pick people who are not state actors. You bring them call them Zogos, call them whatever name. You organize them, you give them racks. Now, if such people are doing what they are doing in support of the government, then the government should start crying because such people do not support the government. Because it is the government that has the responsibility, the sole responsibility to ensure peace and order. They must ensure law and order. So if anybody come and say they're supporting the government and engages in any act that is unconstitutional, that is against law and order, then you know the government is in trouble because you cannot manage all of the different forces that come that say they're supporting you. So, uh Senator, if all goes well tomorrow or in a few days, because the protest or the Council of Patriots have said that this protest could be more than one day, if their voices ring loud enough uh, for the government to hear, what are steps that the Senate can take to improve those reasons for protestation? You mentioned the economy, the, the lack of... Uh, rule of law, the rampant corruption, what steps could the Senate then take to address those issues of the citizens? Well, you know, I should tell you that exactly one month, one month away from tomorrow, one month before tomorrow, on May 7th, on May 7, the Senate met with President George Weir and shared with President George Weir a, something that was called an aid memoir and had 
nearly five hours of conversation with the with the president. They had we had a, nearly five hours of meeting with the president at the Capitol building. This was the president's first meeting in the Capitol building with the legislature and uh, in particular with the Senate. What were the issues? What was the purpose of the meeting? Let me, let me just read the paragraph, the, the introductory paragraph it says, the Liberian Senate has requested and the president of Liberia has agreed to meet with the Liberian Senate on Tuesday, May 7, 2019 to discuss issues and matters of national concern and interest. Generally, the president and the Senate engagement is intended to be a forum for exchange of ideas on critical national issues between the president and the Liberian Senate with the aim to improve information sharing for the necessary and effective performance of duty and responsibility in the best interest of the Liberian people. The issues and matters of national concern and interest which the Senate wishes to discuss, I should now say which the Senate discussed mm -hmm. with the president on May 7, 2019 were the protests organized by the Council of Patriots, two, justice and security issue, peace, justice and security issues, the economic situation, three, four, status of the investigation reports on the alleged loss of $16 billion and the investigation of the expenditure use of $25 million intended to mop up uh, exercise to mop up excess, excess Liberian dollar from the market. Five, the United Nations letter regarding management of funds for development. Six, political and social issues, proposal for a national conference. Seven, information from the government to the people. Eight, withdrawal of the tenure bill. Nine, assess, you know, assess the, 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 the performance of government officials. And 10, the inclusion in government of qualified professionals from across political lines. Now, these were 10, ten issues. We spent five hours with the president as part of national leadership. The president, if we took, if I, there's a whole document, each of the issues were put forward and say, let us discuss these issues. And you are president, you are the executive. Many of the issues are left with you to, to, to show leadership. These, if some of these issues have been answered, have been dealt with the way we expected. We won't be talking about the most uh, protests because you will give hope to the people that don't now go in the street today or tomorrow. Because some of the things you said you were concerned about are under consideration. Actions have been taken. And here is how you can participate in looking for the solution for the problem, the question that you raised. Hmm? That is how you will stop demonst dem demonstrators, demonstration. But if you say nothing, or if I hear, as we're hearing today, very sadly, where the issue then becomes somebody insulting the president, that nobody who insults the president will walk freely through the streets of Morovia. That is very, very unfortunate. Very unfortunate. Do you, you know, think that added fuel to the fire, to the protest fire? I, I don't know. Let me let me put it this way. So 
the people, somebody insults the president. So you say the president will not walk freely through the street. What does that mean? So somebody insults the president, you grab them and you beat them up. And maybe in the process, the president dies or the president is so sick. But then the president, the president's children, the, ch the president's man, or the president's father, or the uncle, or his friends, these are all, oh, because my friend says so, so and so, they beat him up. Okay, we'll find a solution. This time now, they're not coming to demonstrate. They find a solution to, to pay back. And it's difficult to reach to the president. So the people who will do that will go attack people who work for the president. Do you understand what the statement means? It's what it's an unfortunate statement because throughout the president has been showing a great deal of political maturity and tolerance. And I would think he needed to, he needs to keep along that path. He needs to keep on that path. Nobody, nobody should make, I mean, look, man, what insults people than a woman who is who was older than all the people? There was no political party leader who was older than Ellen Johnson Salif. And a woman, internationally recognized, respected. Look at the insults that people are saying. And sometimes some of the people who were involved in the insults were people that she had supported, you know, who, they, and some of them were giving jobs in your government or their relatives were working in your government. If she had decided, they said, anybody who calls me, who insults me, will not walk through the streets of Morovia. You know what you, the mandate you're giving to the people who, who, who support you? This is a dangerous statement by the president because the people who love him, there are plenty. The people who are, who are circle fans and who say they're doing things in his name, they will begin to do things in his name and they only need to hear because he doesn't hear all the insults, the so-called insults. But so in a nightclub or in a community, somebody there say something about George Weah. Then the president say, Oh, my boss man say anybody who say anything about them will not walk in the street. So how you stop this man from walking in the street? Eh? And you'll go do something that will forbid them from going in the street. That means you'll break their leg or you do something for them to go to the hospital and if they ain't lucky, they will die. So presidents do not make statements like that. With your understanding of the present climate in Liberia. Um, well, let me start with this. Today, there were women and uh, market women who were chanting, we want peace, no more war. So there is that fear in the country of war. Um, there are still people in Liberia who lived through the war and are still dealing with the effects of it. Are you in any way concerned that this protest could prompt or be um, an event that could lead to war, toward a, a potential war in Liberia? It is not the protest. I'm telling you again, over and over. It's not protest that leads to war. It's the violence that is introduced by those who have the, who have the preponderance of violence, who have control over violence. All of the wars you have heard about are not, people just don't sit there and do something. The liberation wars that led to freedom fighters, whether South Africa, Namibia, and all of this, it was because somebody who had power, who had guns, who had this, suppressed other people. So other people start looking for guns to fight. In the case of uh, Liberia, the 14 years of war, what happened was there were people who had guns who began to oppress. And every time they disagree with people, they went after them, beat them up. So some of the other people decided, but we cannot sit here and get, get beaten and die. Then they look for guns. 
you know, and sometimes they take the first guns that they got, they take it from the, the, the people who got the guns. They take it from the police or the army. Mm -hmm. So the responsibility to ensure that the country does not degenerate to that level lies with the government. And I'm speaking because I have experience as somebody who grew up from civil society to government. I'm currently a senator and everybody knows my work in the Liberian Senate has been to work and do things ensuring that we stick to the law, that we follow justice, that we ensure that we, we, we remind ourselves about the need to have peace. Because throughout the war, I was not with any group that held gun to shoot. What I did on the contrary was being part of those who were looking for ways to end the war. That's what I did until we went to Accra. And that is why if you find the Accra Peace Agreement, I was a signatory to that agreement, not as a warring faction leader, but as one representing civil society that wanted the end of the war. And today, I know what I'm talking about. I know how the, the war started and how conflict can degenerate into violence. And so whatever I say is, you know, is to say, let's do it in such a way that this thing will not degenerate into violence. The people organizing the demonstration are not the people who are looking for the violence. No. They are people who are trying to express disagreement with certain policies. And then as they express this, some people say by expressing it, you are going to cause trouble. How you know now this person is? The person expressing what they say. They say, we the senators, we mentioned this thing. You investigating a money business. You say money got missing. We want the full account of that investigation so that when we know who, how this money got missing, then we follow it. We heard officials of government, leaders of the ruling political party say that uh, they saw people loading money and taking them to people's houses. So if you know that, if you actually know that this is what happened, ah, then it's easy. The investigation should be very easy because the people who say they saw these people, that then you call first. You take them to the police so they can give more information. Then they will go follow the people, for, go to the places where they say the money went. That's the first one. The other part of the money is the 25 million. Yeah. There is a policy, a pro process by which money can be taken in the market to be able to mop up. That policy is clear. The, the people who take the $25 million, did they follow that policy? If they didn't follow the policy, why? That is another investigation. So people who are in that situation mm -hmm. must be held responsible. And the public have to see that the, you are taking action that ensuring that the, people who are who are who, who, who are call that action is taking against them not just to pick up anybody because if you do that the law say you got you the burden of proof lies with you so senator on unification day in liberia the council of patriots were invited to a meeting with the president um the un and um I believe ECOWAS was also were also present, um, and they were asked to, or the Council of Patriots were asked to present their list of demands or their reasons for protestation, as, as you called it. Um, but they did not. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I'm not the Council of Patriots. What I do know is that. They have chosen when and how 
to do their presentation. If the government wants it a certain way, the government will use every channel available, peaceful channel. That's what government does. You have all the power next to God, the power lies in the government. You got these, um, if you wanted the, the, if you wanted to, how did the things we talk about, eh? The things are listed just now. How do we get them? We are representatives of the people. So our people come and tell us that these are the concerns they have. So if you call the Patriots, the Council of Patriots, and they say they, they are not ready to give you at that time, find a way to engage them. Find a way to engage them, you know, if that is to say that you government, you are not hearing that people are hungry, that you are not hearing that people do not have, that there was injustice in Kabina Janet's uh, case, that you as a government, that you are not hearing that, you know, uh, uh, corruption is being talked about. Now you, they, that's your weakness on the part of the government. You cannot say you haven't heard all these things. That you want somebody to tell you. If the president, our people say, when you are talking to somebody, they say, they're not all the words that come from their mouth that you can act on. They say, you look at the Adam's apple, you look under their throat. The way that thing going up and down, then you can know whether the president won't drink water, they're hungry. They, they ain't talking. They get talking. But since they've been talking like I've been talking now, you know, then I start, you know now, I think, hmm, Senator Wilson want to drink. Let me get, look for some water for him to drink. If you don't do that, if you are not able to see that when I talk, talk, there are swallow spit, that means I need something. That's what our people say. So you met with them. You say they did not tell you. So you be in this town. You don't hear anything? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. And we have Dennis has joined us, um, our host. So welcome, Dennis. Thanks for joining us <laughs> near the end. Thank you. And uh, welcome again, Senator Wizard, to focus on Liberia. Thank you. Okay. Uh, please uh, give me two minutes. Let me get some water to drink. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yes. And at this time, we'll be opening our phone lines so you can uh, call in and be a part of the conversation. The number to call is 706 684 0392. Again, the number 706 684 0392. We want to welcome all our viewers across the globe. This is Focus on Liberia. We are discussing, again, the June 7 protest organized by the Council of Patriots. It's, this is the eve of the protest, and we are excited to have Senator Wiese express his thoughts on the protest. There are also uh, comments on Facebook, but uh, you can call in. The number will be posted shortly. It's 706 684 0392. Back to you, Danielle. Thanks, Dennis. Um, just to kind of summarize our conversation up to now, um, the senator can surely correct me if my understanding is wrong, um, but he believes our concern here shouldn't be a debate about whether or not the protest um, should occur or not. He believes that it is the people's right to protest and that if they feel they want to protest, they can, it's their right. Um, however, what we really need to dig into are the reasons that um, the people feel the need to protest. And some of the reasons that he has um, listed are the current economic situation in Liberia. Uh, we know the currency or the rate um, it is, it, excuse me, inflation is um, increasing rapidly. Um, another issue for protestation or reason for protestation he stated was um, 
rampant corruption. Uh, one of the examples that were alluded to or issues that um, was brought up is uh, the failure of the president to declare his assets. Uh, we also talked about the lack of rule of law. Um, many or some believe that the impeachment of Kabina Jana was unconstitutional. So there is a concern there as well. So Senator Wiesa, welcome back. Thank you. <laughs> now, now I finished drinking some water and <laughs> the... Um, just to remind our audience, if you would like to call in, the number is 706-684-0392. Again, that is 706-684-0392. Um, yesterday, we had a lot of callers and we couldn't get to everyone. So if we don't get to you today, we're sorry. It's not intentional. We can't pick which calls we receive. We use a regular landline phone. Um, yeah, and, and please remember to be respectful. Um, this is a platform where we are open to hearing everyone's point of view. And we also just want to learn from each other. Um, but uh, what is utmost here is respect. Okay, so once again, the phone number is 706 684 0392, and we are talking about the upcoming protests and the reasons uh, people felt the need to protest. Okay, Danielle, we have a caller on the line. Call out your name and where you're calling from. Hi, my name is Rose Dewey Carmore. I'm calling from PA, Philadelphia. Welcome, Rose. Your question or comment? Your response. Um, uh, at okay. some point, at some point, the the line was breaking. So, can you just summarize what what she she was saying? I, I really didn't get the fullness of this of a, a quick question. All right. One of our issue is, uh, if you the people are angry, there's a lot of anger and there's hunger. So, if you put them in the street, according to our previous guest yesterday. Definitely, there's going to be chaos. So, is that what you are suggesting? And the second point is, is she said, or oh, why is it that people in Liberia they are not opening up to the people in the diaspora? Like, if you want to get something done, like an NGO or something you want done, people in Liberia that are in the position of power do not open up, as if diaspora Liberians are from another planet. All right. 
on the, um, the the first thing about uh, many people are illiterate, they're hungry, they're, they've always been illiterate and hungry people. And that is why government's responsibility is to first make sure that we, we work to bring down illiteracy, to make sure we reduce the number of hungry people and, and think that's part of the responsibility of a government. All right. Um, am I the one putting the uh, one, do I want the hungry people and illiterate people to go in the street? Of course not. That's, that. I mean, the only thing I'm saying is that it is not my choice. It is not whether I want it or don't want it. What I have chosen to do when I got, when I went to ask to be elected was that I said I would do many things to reduce the illiterate people and to reduce hungry people. And I knew I wouldn't do it, be able to do it alone. So we we'll have to do it through a policy realm. And then we work towards ensuring that thing. And I do my bit while I'm a senator. I do my bit when I was, I did my bit when I wasn't senator and will continue to do it so long as I'm alive. And I think all Liberians should have that type of attitude, you know? So if we fail, then people have the right to come and ask me and say, look, we've elected you because we wanted you to reduce the number of illiterate people or this and that. You know, we don't see it, we are not happy, or we want you to do it. And in that way, this is the way I think we should do it. You know, now, I want them in the street. If I could, I would not put them in the street because what I would like to do is for them to believe that I'm doing something for them to go to school, that I'm doing something for their hunger to reduce. Because they themselves know that it's not possible for me immediately to make all of them not to be, I mean, to have 100% literacy and for all of our people not to be, not to have hungry people among us. But they must see, they should see me doing something. Okay. So it seems we've uh, lost Dennis. Uh, I think the second part of her question was, um, why is it, it seems that Liberians in Liberia oh, tend oh. to... Well, let me tell you, let me tell you that I, I ran when I was Minister of State without portfolio. Part of my responsibilities included working with the Liberian diaspora. And I worked with uh, the Liberian diaspora. In fact, the diaspora secretariat was in my, was part of the departments that I uh, supervised. And we set it up, we got funding from UN agencies and hire people from the diaspora who were running that secretariat. You know, the purpose, and I truly believe that Liberian and the diaspora have an important role to play in the development of our country. They are Liberians, first and foremost. I'm one of those who truly believe that we do ourselves harm if we do not, if we do not consider Liberians in the diaspora as full part and parcel of our country's uh, development and programs. I, I'm not speaking because I'm, I've been working on that. I've been working on it. I worked on it. I worked with institutions. I raised resources to support that engagement, the, the Liberian uh, diaspora engagement. I left the office. Unfortunately, the, um, when I left the job and went to run, run for the Senate, you know, that office, uh, under Mrs. Sirleaf, I think after she also left, I don't know what has happened to the office so far. So, um, Honorable, can you tell us then your position on dual citizenship? I am totally so in support of it. In fact, my position is that we are giving a good thing a bad name. Liberian is a Liberian. Just think about it. Just think about it. The U.S. where we are, do we know that U.S. does not 
support, does not have dual citizenship in this constitution? No, they don't. What they do know is that when you come to the United States and say that I want to be an American, wherever you go, when you have a problem, they go and protect you as an American citizen. Okay? It is they who say you are their citizen by their law. Once you say so, a Liberian born as a Liberian, he comes and leaves. He can go wherever he goes and tell people, say, I'm so so and so. But I know that my son is a Liberian. So why am I going to, to disenfranchise him or uh, 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 denationalize him just because I heard? Only Liberia, where people go around going asking questions, uh, who is a Liberian? I mean, who uh, 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 declared themselves a citizen of another country? The other people don't do it. The others don't do it. The United States doesn't do it. You go an American citizen in Liberia, you go to the American embassy for information, whether or not that person is, the, the, you never get that information. They protect because they say that is their citizen. Why are Liberians not able to say, this person is my citizen? I don't care whether he came to America and say he is an American. I consider him as a Liberian. That's what Ghana is doing. That's what Rwanda is doing. That's why they're getting their money. But some people in their narrow minds, they believe that if they go behind their brother or their sister, their cousin, then they will deny their cousin a joint, a common property that they have. Because then they say, you are an American citizen, so you can't have this piece of land. It's just backwardness. It's backward thinking. You know, narrow-mindedness. OK. Um, so since we lost Dennis and um, some of the calls for the moment, I'll um, bring up some of the Facebook questions. So we have a, a general <laughs> requests about whether or not you support the reduction of senator and represent or legislature uh, salaries in order to help boost the economy or increase money for spending in other areas. I think again, you know, when we, this is, this is a very pedestrian solution. It's not a, it's not a durable solution to, to an economic problem. The country, we are trying to say you have to create, make a product, the economy must be productive. It must produce and, and increase wealth in the society. It does not, it does not uh, become better by, by uh, what you think you're doing, by, you know, it's, it's the mentality again that we have. Sometimes it sounds, it sounds uh, very, again, very, very, you know, you say, if you cut the person's salary, then it will help the economy. How many senators there are? There are 30 senators. So if you were to take $5,000 from each senator, you know, from their salary, you know, what would that do? How does that help now to create to increase the production capacity, to make sure that we produce rubber, to, that, that we produce uh, 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 what call, tires and things that give jobs to our people. How would that do that? So we, by taking that position, is a populist position. I don't have any problem. But how does that, I just want to know how it's going to increase our productive capacity. You know, how would that produce the, I mean, increase the productive capacity? All right, so if they cut my salary, you know, and then what do I do? The, the few people that I thought I was helping, I would now have big excuses not to help them. But I know also that that money that is cut from my salary is not gonna go into any productive use until we deal with the process 
the, the, the institutions that ensure that when we take this money, it will be used for productive purposes that will enhance the economy, the growth of the economy. Then that time, we're not going to be looking for salaries as the only way by which uh, 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 the, the society will grow. No. I mean, the, the United States, they keep increasing salaries because the economy is growing. You know, I mean, I, it's only again the populist and we just get up and say, hey, me, I can say it. Go and cut all my salary. I don't need, you know, it will not make any difference. Okay. Um, uh, one or two of the possible demands of the Council of Patriots that's been discussed before is uh, the call to for Finance Minister Atwe to be fired, as well as uh, head of the central bank, uh, Mr. Patriot, to also be uh, fired. Do you support that idea? Do you think it would have a positive effect on the economy? or would bring forth the results that the protesters essentially are hoping for, which is a better economy? Well, I told you that as very, I, I try to be a very serious person, you know? And so when we have a problem, I look for the solution. The solution is not just firing. We said in order for us to determine, to determine the quality of manpower that must be in the government, we think there must be an assessment of the performance of all government officials that have been- Senator Wiese, let me, let me hold you there one second. We are having technical difficulty. So let me bring in a caller. Call your name and where are you calling from? Hi, my name is Ben and I'm calling from Minnesota. Your name again? My name is Benjamin and I'm calling from Minnesota. Benjamin, your question or comment? Take your answer off the line. Senator, it's about your salary. Well, I mean, you see, one of the things, the beauty of this exercise is that uh, for, for the speaker, this is his solution to the economic problem of our country. So that's good. So when, when, when the economic discussions begin, I think that part should be put on the table as a, a major solution that he has to trying to revamp our economy. That will make sure that we have more people employed, that we'll be able to, our productive capacity will increase. You know, it's not about me saying that I cut my salary. It's populist to say that, to, for me to take that approach. So and I'm not gonna enter the debate as to whether cut my salary or not cut my salary. It's neither here or there. If that is the decision this, if this is the policy decision that, and we are being able to demonstrate that by this cut, I'm not even talking about the figures because people, I mean, people, I, in many times I hear what they say it is one way or the other. And that's not for me, it's neither here or there. Okay. Let us think about it. And I don't know what he does, the gentleman who asked the question. Is that the only solution he has for the economy, for the revamping of the economy. But, but Senator, the people, are, people are taken to the street for various reasons. Yeah. The salary or the alleged high salary of legislators is one of them. Okay. Now you know better. You know right. better. They say the economic hardship. So part of the economic hardship is because of the salaries that people make. That's fine. Yeah. So let's find a solution. 
Right. So, what is, so what is your first? First of all, how much do you make, and what is the solution? What or is the relevance? For what is the relevance of that? Is it to because test the, whether the question, I can keep, the the question keep coming up as huh? to how much people make, and people throw figures here and there. So you are on FOL if you can tell us how much senators make. That's so not just the rest. No, no, no. You know, if the gentlemen are including yourself. Okay. The, 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 the uh, salaries of every government official is in the national budget. Take the national budget, open the national budget, and then analyze from school teacher to, to, president, to the president. It should be reflected in the budget. In fact, this is the kind of transparency that we say when you have, then you will determine whether a person is corrupt or not corrupt. But if you if you get coming to ask, you go ask George Weir, you go ask the school teacher in your village, you know, and see what you're talking about. Yeah, the one in my village I know. There's another caller on the line. Call out your name and where you're calling from. Call out your name and where you're calling from. Okay, I think we lost that. Kolo, are you on mute? Okay. Um, so, Senator, if people are going. Well, if we've, uh, if we've lost the caller, I'll take another question from on Facebook. And we have a question regarding the war and economic crimes court. That is also one of the reasons that the protesters are protesting. There's a call to have a war and economic uh, crime court. Do you support a war and economic crime court? Well, you know, um, I think we've had a discussion on this matter before. I want to go historical that the question of the uh, of war crimes court was one of the debates that took place in the signing of the Comprehensive Peace Agreement. The compromise was that there would be the TRC. It was the same approach that was given to the situation in South Africa, that at the end of those years of apartheid rule and all the serious damage to the economy, the deniers of, 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 of by, I mean, the, the, the suffering that Black people suffered, mm -hmm. they decided they should have a TRC so that people then reorganize and build a new society. That's what happened. And South Africa was used as a pre, I mean, prime example in the debate uh, in Accra when the peace agreement was signed. Mm -hmm. So ever since that time, the government has created courts that would deal with crimes, economic crimes. They being existing courts, but more with courts with more power. So I think that unless people actually think that they have clear court issues. And again, I am neither there fighting to say yes or no. I'm only saying that we have this thinking out of an agreement. And that agreement has kept us peaceful for the last 15 years. Since the agreement was signed in 2003, 2023 to now, we haven't gone back to war. Then it means something was good about that agreement. And I say, you can't fix it when in sport. It doesn't mean that people who committed heinous crimes and who have not organized themselves to, for, to, to, to say that they would not continue along that path should not be held. They must be brought because they, the, the, the TRC was very clear that crimes against humanity are not 
you cannot uh, enjoy immunity from it. That any crime against it that is against international law must be accounted for. So if we think that we are now in a position to set up such a court and we know the cost of it and that we are doing it not believing that some taxpayer in the United States or in Sweden and they will do it, that we think this is the priority issue we have, then let's go for it. But it must be determined by our people again. And the legislature is a key part of this. Okay. Um, going back again to the Council of Patriots and the protests, um, the Council of Patriots met with, briefly met with the Senate. Were you present for that meeting? No, I was not present. I was not there. Um, I, I'm telling you, if you know, there is not a single thing that had to do with the peace in our country that I have not been active in, especially in the Senate, in the legislature. The document I was telling you about, the A memoir that dealt with all these issues to have with the president, I was present. I was a key part of it. I was part of the committee that drafted it, that the Senate approved and had a meeting with the president. I was a spokesperson in that meeting. So I, on the issue of justice that you see in the issue about Cabena and the rest of the stuff, I'm sure you heard, that I'm one of the senators that took colleagues to the Supreme Court, that they were doing things in violation of the constitution. And you, you know, I mean, my position has been very, very clear on all of these issues without fear. So the Council of Patriots, the people that I know, individuals that I know, and they decided to, when they met with the Senate, the meeting did not carry on, did not go on as, I guess, as um, it was anticipated, you know. So the outcome was not, uh, if I, even though I wasn't there, I wrote to my colleagues, on our, on our uh, 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 Senate page, our platform, and told them that they and the Council of Patriots, we and the Council of Patriots must discuss what we discussed with the president. Because they agree with everything that we said, everything we wrote. So it, it, what we heard is that the Council of Patriots found, found the issue with um, the media not being allowed in the meeting. Did you, or do you have an issue with that? I think that the, what we have done in all the conversations that I have had with some of the uh, members of the Council of Patriots, I think our 10 points that I mentioned to you were 10 points on which there have been no disagreement. The one that we, we put forward to the president. So if the Council of Patriots met with the Senate, I think the best thing, as I said to them, to my colleagues, that I wasn't present, that we must tie ourselves around the same issues, since those are the same issues of concern to them. Because those are the issues of our people, the people of Liberia. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm sorry to the audience that Dennis uh, was having technical issues and he's the one that has the phone line. Um, so we won't be able to take any more calls, um, but we wanna thank everyone for joining and Senator, could you please just give us your final thoughts on the protests tomorrow? My final thoughts about the protest tomorrow is that I think that the government to live up to his commitment, commitment that he made to the Liberian people, to the international community, that the government will allow the protests to be held. And that routes that they agree with the protesters, they with the Council of Patriots will be observed that they will not 
they will exercise a great deal of restraint. A police power must not at all exceed the normal process of guiding and protecting the protesters, as was agreed in their statement with the, the demonstrator, the protesters. The protesters, you know, and I cannot say all protesters, I'm saying the leadership, the leadership council of patriots that organize, that say that they are the organizers, that they too will meet up with their obligation of, that the obligation of organizers to go consistent with the agreement to help the police work alone with the people to ensure that nothing happens out of the way. There might be agent provocateurs. They both, the organizers and the police must recognize that, that one agent provocateur, the one who will take a stone and throw it to the police must not be interpreted as the action of the entire organizers. It must not be. Because it could be the agent provocateur can also come from the government. It can come from the, the um, ordinary guy who wants an opportunity to loot. But we must not give such people that opportunity. Because when the police react to it, then things get out of the way. We saw yesterday the case with uh, uh, Koluba. We saw yesterday the case with the students. If nobody arrested a student leader, the, no the noises that took place would never have happened. Nobody would have known. It's only when they arrested the police, uh, the student leader. You don't do that. You know, the statement by the president today on the eve of this, it's not helpful. And those of us who are supposed to be close to the president should always help him. Because this is the time when you come under, when your leadership, any leader comes under stream. Because when people come, they will be making all manner of expressions. Some will say, in fact, go get out of the office. We have heard it before. We heard people talking about Ellen Sally must get out of the office. Then this will happen today. The speaker, the current speaker of the of the House of Representatives made those, those statements in, in, front, in front of uh, uh, demonstrators. You know, so I think we can once again demonstrate that we are serious leaders. We, the people of Liberia, we must not disgrace ourselves again and do things that will make the international community have to come and try to say that our country is, has become ungovernable. And that primary responsibility comes from the leadership, from the country, from the president and all of those who, who uh, you asked me about, you asked me about some of the people, the economic managers, I said, that there will be, the president should do an assessment. It, that's what the, that why governments have, I mean, uh, they reorganize their government when they have, a, you don't, you reorganize for whatever reason, they call it reshuffling. Anything that happens is essentially in the hands of the president. And we as senators are standing, we should play our role I think that in some cases we did not play our role. We did not play our role, especially in the case around the Cabinet Janet stuff. We show that we did not submit ourselves to the rule of law. You know, that we showed that we were not respecting the constitution, the court system, the judiciary have to stand up and stand up for the truth and stand up for the law. If these three branches, they for purpose that they were three branches that should work together. If we do not do our part in each of our branches, then our people give up on us and they try to take the law into their own hands. Then we must take the responsibility for any uh, situation 
that is on that goes on to us. I think we can do better. We have experience, we have the manpower, we have people who know better. And together we can make our country a better place. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Lisa. Um, and thank you again to our guests uh, for joining us. We will be back on Sunday, our regularly scheduled time at 6 p.m. Eastern. This Sunday, we continue our series on the Liberian Civil War, and we will be speaking with some of the survivors of the Civil War. They'll tell us their experiences, and we'll see the Civil War through their lens. So please join us again on Sunday at 6 p.m. Eastern, where we'll be talking about the Civil War. Um, before I go, I also want to say that I hope for a very peaceful protest tomorrow. Um, I, too, have family in Liberia that I'm concerned about, so I hope everything is peaceful. Um, I hope both sides of the argument, whether you feel the the government is doing a great job or you feel the government is not doing enough that you will respect your friends or your neighbor's opinion. There's no need to be violent to get your, um, your thought or your opinion across. Okay, so we just, we pray for peace, we hope for peace and we love all of you. So thanks for joining us and we'll see you on Sunday at 6 p.m. Eastern. Thanks again, Senator Lisa. Thank you.